in structural electronics. Uh, Professor Wim has authored and co-authored more than 50 science uh, SEI listed and more than 50, 80 presentations and proceedings in international conferences. And he also holds uh, two patents. He has an extensive national and international scientific uh, network and has worked on projects uh, from pure fundamental research all the way to industry driven projects. Uh, Professor Wim, uh, it's wonderful to have you here and over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction and, and also thanks uh, for the organizer to invite me for, for this presentation. So indeed, I'm, I'm Professor Wim de Fermer from Hasselt University, working in the Institute for Materials Research. Um, and I would like to, to talk today about ultrasonic spray coating. Uh, ultrasonic spray coating as a, a versatile technique for large area deposition of functional materials. So uh, let's start. Um, so first of all um where i'm coming from well um i'm, I'm working in in belgium in hassel hassel is located here in the northeast of, of belgium in in europe um and in principle uh working in the institute for materials research imo imo uh, is a collaboration between uh two institutes on the one hand uh, you have uh, the university of Hasselt, which is located here in in Hasselt, uh, or in diepenbeek close to Hasselt uh, that you can see here. But on the other hand, more towards the, the applied research, we have IMAC. Um, this is a microelectronic center um, located in Leuven, so in more or less the middle of Belgium. And both institutes collaborate in uh, what we call the Institute for Materials Research, which is located here, close to the University of Hasselt. And that's where I'm doing my research. And, and uh, this is the, the building where everything happens. So. If you look at uh, the research institute, we have 23 professors there working on uh, new materials, innovative materials, starting from the chemistry, development, synthesis of materials towards the physics, understanding the properties of these materials to uh, help uh, chemistry people to, to update and to optimize uh, their materials. And then we, we move forward toward engineering where we apply these materials, these functional materials for uh, industrial relevant applications. So if you look at printed electronics, uh, we also have a full value chain there in the Institute. Uh, we start with the development of, of the materials, the polymers, uh, small molecules, uh, also diamond. This is one of the materials we synthesize. And then of course, like I said, you go to physics. We do a lot of characterization, optoelectronic characterization, mechanical characterization, uh, morphological characterization, and so on. Um, we make small devices to test these uh, materials in, in device physics, uh, do some modeling, some prototyping. And then, of course, if you go to, uh, to the engineering part, uh, we have the printing and coating, which is uh, my responsibility, but also lifetime and reliability of, of these devices, of these uh, printed devices is an important asset if you move to uh, industrial relevant uh, applications. And linked to that, we also have an ID towards valorization. So we have uh, science parks uh, co collected in, in the area to, to work together with companies, startups, uh, spin-off projects, and so on, uh, to bring these materials towards uh, real life. So let's focus a bit on, on my research group. My research group is called Functional Materials Engineering. So what we do, we, we print these functional materials, these functional inks. Uh, we develop also ink testing systems. Um, we have, sorry, that was a bit too fast. Um, we also have um, collaborations with, with, uh, with, with industrial partners to test these inks. And of course, we develop uh, applications. And you see a few here on, on the left side. I, I start with screen printing. Uh, screen printing is one of the techniques we use in the lab. And for example, below there, you see a screen printed light emitting device on a textile. Uh, you can see it's quite flexible and still lights up. Um, then we move to inkjet printing, which is a technique that um, deposits very fine structures. Uh, like you, for example, can see here in this honeycomb structure printed with silver. Uh, but also very thin. Uh, you can go down to a few hundreds of nanometers thickness. Um, and we use this honeycomb, for example, in organic light emitting devices as one of the, the contacts. 
And then finally, and that will be the to topic of today, is, is ultrasonic spray coating. And with this ultrasonic spray coating, you uh, can, in principle, go to large area deposition coatings, functional coatings, that have an, uh, a thickness down to a few tens of nanometers, uh, so very, very thin, but of course can also go up a bit. And an example that you see here is this 3D printed part where we coated it with uh, a functional ink but I will explain that a bit later uh, in the presentation. Okay, so um, what will be the, the topic of today? Uh, I said ultrasonic spray coating. So I, I start with, of course, an introduction on ultrason ultrasound and, and, and spray coating in general, talk a bit about the technology. And then I talk about the uh, deposit deposition of functional coatings, uh, starting with, of course, the droplet generation uh, using this ultrasonic or ultrasound. Then, of course, the droplet transport, and finally, also the impact of the droplets on the substrate and the layer formation. And then, finally, I show some applications linked to polymers, to nanoparticles, and even to uh, more complex ink formulation and 3D objects uh, to finally conclude the, the presentation. So let's start with um, the introduction. Uh, if you look at uh, ultrasonic spray coating, uh, then you have the name ultrasound there or ultrasonic there. And ultrasound, is, as you can see here, uh, is uh, located in, in uh, range in frequencies between 20 kilohertz and 2 megahertz. Uh. You have a lot of um, applications there in, in medical field, also in destructive field, but also uh, animals, uh, chemistry, diagnostics. So this is one part of the story, uh, using ultrasound to generate droplets. And of course, if you talk about spray coating, on, on the other hand, uh, the second part of, of the, uh, the the title of the system, um, then most of you probably think about, for example, coating uh, a car, putting a coating on a car, which is a coating principally uh, going in, in the order of 80 to 100 micrometers thick. And the nozzles or the, the droplets generated for this um, spray coating for car industry, for example, is based on pressure. So um, you shear your liquids and then you generate droplets. Um, while if you compare it to ultrasound, so ultrasonic nozzles, we use harmonic vibrations in the ultrasound region, in our case around 120 kilohertz, to atomize the, the fluid, the liquid, and to generate droplets of the same diameter, uh, the same content, uh, the same composition. Uh, and that's, of course, completely different because with this ultrasonic um, uh, droplet generation, you create very tiny droplets that can be used to deposit very thin uh, layers, like I said, below micrometer range, while with pressurized nozzles, it's much more difficult to go to this very thin um, uh, layers. Okay, so if you look at, at ultrasound acoustics, of course, it's very, very old. Uh, you go to 6th to, uh, century before Christ, uh, Pythagoras, who started describing uh, stringed instruments, uh, talking about acoustics, and then going uh, a bit further to 1793, where uh, Spallanzani um, described echolocation in, in bats, in animals. Um, and then finally, in, in 1880, 1882, uh, Jacques and Pierre Curie came with uh, the piezoelectric effect or the converse piezoelectric effect. Um, and, and further, we came to uh, what is called the theory of sound described by, by Rayleigh. Um, and, and that's, let's say, the, the basic starting point of developments in the range of uh, using droplets, using uh, ultrasound to, to generate droplets. And it uh, took, uh, let's say, more or less 100 years for, for Lang to come up with the correlation between these atomized droplets, the size of the, these droplets, and um, the Rayleigh liquid wavelength. Uh, so um, you look at the, at the figure here below, uh, we, we generate um, liquid flow between two piezoelectric elements. Uh, that's why this piezoelectric effect is, is, uh, is mentioned here. And then due to this piezo, uh, piezoelectric movement um, with this high frequency, uh, you generate uh, small droplets. And that's uh, the, the principle behind the ultrasonic spray coating system. Here you see the ultrasonic spray coater. Uh, this is the complete setup of, of let's say, the nozzle. Uh, you have the nozzle here where you have the liquid feed. 
here and the liquid goes to um, these, um, let's say, uh, ultrasonic generate, this, this ultrasonic generator, so these piezoelectric elements that um, generate droplets that uh, here at the atomizing surface, the nozzle tip where you have the atomization, so you have your frequency applied, um, you have the droplets generated. I will come back to this in, in some next slides. But of course, if you generate droplets by just atomizing the surface, you will create droplets that have no or limited kinetic energy. So they, they do not move towards the substrate unless only by gravitation. So that's why we have this system here where you have your uh, gas, your shroud gas that is injected here and that takes these droplets with a specific uh, gas pressure towards the substrate. And, and that's the way it, it works. And then of course, depending on the distance between the nozzle and the substrate, depending on the shroud gas itself, depending on a lot of parameters that I will talk about, you can define the angle uh, and, and the width of impact of these uh, droplets onto the substrate. So that's um, something to talk, talk about somewhat later. So here again, you see the, the inside of um, the uh, ultrasonic generator. Uh, so I, I talked about these piezoelectric elements. So you have the expansion and the compression of this uh, to at a specific uh, frequency to generate um, ultrasound. And at, at, um, with, with, let's say, the, the meaning of generating these droplets. Uh, here you see uh, how it works. Uh, you see the liquid coming towards the nozzle plate. And at the nozzle plate, you have your liquid flown, a very thin liquid uh, layer. And then, of course, because of the vibration, the ultrasonic vibration of these nozzle plates, you get standing waves. And due to these standing waves, if you put more and more energy in these standing waves, you create or you generate droplets that com come loose from these uh, these high tops, high tips of the of the, the amplitudes. Um, so, like I said, uh, if you have this way of, of generating droplets, these droplets have nearly no kinetic energy. But the the benefit of, of it is that these droplets all have more or less the same size, in the order of 20 micrometers in in our case. So, using this 120 kilohertz, we range around. 20 micrometers. And also because you do an, um, an ultrasonic vibration, the homogeneity of your ink, uh, having polymers or nanoparticles or and so on, will be very, very um, general over the droplets. So all the droplets have more or less the same concentration of, of polymer nanoparticle solvents in, in there. So that's where we start. Um, we have the droplet generation. And then, of course, you start spraying them. You, you start uh, generating these droplets and then bring them towards a substrate. So you have the transport, transport of the droplets. Um, one of the, the benefits of, of having, having this ultrasonic vibration, of course, is what, what is mentioned here, is the deagglomeration. So uh, you have your um, liquid here, your, your ink here, functional ink. And of course, the chances are there that in this functional ink, uh, some nanoparticles will cluster together. And if you look in research, uh, people try to um, use uh, ligands and these kind of things to stabilize these nanoparticles, not to cluster, not to agglomerate together. Um, but what we saw in, in using this ultrasonic spray coater is that also by using ultrasound, uh, um, you get, um, let's say, a an, an homogeneous distribution of your nanoparticles, for example, or your polymer inside your liquid, and finally also in your droplet. Um, so if you bring the droplet from the um, generated, so from the nozzle plate towards the substrate, there's a lot of, of parameters we can play with. Of course, uh, in, in the generating of the droplets, you have the ink itself, you have the, the nanoparticle content, the polymer content, your concentration. Um, but you also have, uh, finally, here, what you see here, you have the spacing of um, the, the, the deposition pattern. Um, you have the velocity of the nozzle, so we move our nozzle over the substrate with a specific velocity. You also have the flow rate, so the, the amount of material you deposit per minute. Um, we have the nozzle atomizing power, so the power you apply 
per, uh, for, for generating these droplets. You have the distance to the substrate, so the distance between the nozzle plate and the substrate itself. Of course, temperature of the substrate plays an important role because we use um, liquids, uh, we use solvents uh, that, that can evaporate during flight, but also on impact uh, with, with, with the substrate if your temperature is higher than, than room temperature, of course. Um, and we also have the shroud pressure itself, so the pressure of the um, carrier gas that we apply to bring these uh, droplets towards the substrate, because, <coughs> sorry for that, um, because of course if you, if you apply higher pressures, uh, the velocity of the droplets towards the substrate will also increase. And finally, uh, you can also think about coating and overcoating. So you can put several layers on top of each other because I was discussing about the, the thinnest uh, size we can go for or uh, the thickness going around, let's say, 13 nanometers. But of course, if you want to go to layers having several micrometer, micrometer thickness, you can on the one hand increase, of course, the concentration. Uh, the, the ultrasonic uh, spray coater can go to from very low viscous inks, uh, water-based inks or, or viscosity uh, compared to water towards quite high viscous inks. Um, but also putting more layers on top will also increase the thickness. So here you see uh, the droplet size distribution for our nozzle, that the nozzle we use around 120 kilohertz and they range, let's say, between 10 and um, 20, 30 micrometers with a peak around 20, nano, uh, 20 uh, micrometers. And um, the, the, um, the benefits of the ultrasonic spray coating system over, for example, the pressurized spray coating system is what I mentioned there. Uh, you have a very controlled droplet size, very narrow distribution of these uh, droplet sizes. Um, and you have a control over the kinetic energy. Yeah? The, the kinetic energy, so the, um, the speed which you uh, apply to the droplet to go to the substrate can be really tuned, for example, with this shroud pressure. So you have a very good control over the droplets and the movement of the droplets, the flight, the transport of the droplets towards the substrate. We have several nozzles. Uh, you can have nozzles where you really make a pattern and you start, uh, like you see on the right side here, you start coating over a very small area. In principle, we have the opportunity to go to line widths in the order of 100 micrometers width. Um, but of course, uh, you talk about ultrasonic spray coating. So if you want to go to large area coatings, you can go for what we call the impact nozzle. And this impact nozzle, this can really spray one substrate up to 30 centimeters in, in width in, in one track. And so that's just by uh, changing, let's say, the, the, the nozzle geometry uh, you can optimize that. For example, besides impact um, and, and the Acumist nozzle, so the Acumist nozzle was for really fine uh, structures. We also have a vortex nozzle where you create droplets in, in all directions uh, because if you use, if you look at those two uh, systems, the droplets, they go perpendicular towards the substrate. So they always land 90 degrees perpendicular onto the substrate. And with this vortex nozzle, for example, you can also have droplets coming from different angles, which can be beneficial, for example, if you want to coat a rough surface. I talked about uh, the, the deagglomeration. So if you have a, a bit of agglomeration in your liquid that goes inside your uh, nozzle, then due to this atomization, due to this ultrasonic vibrations, you get more or less homogeneous distribution of your nanoparticles. Uh, in your in your final droplet, so that's a benefit. And of course, uh, if you go to really large area, you go to roll to roll compatible systems. You can place different nozzles close to each other to really have a coating, a homogeneous coating on, let's say, two meters wide um, foils uh, that that go from roll to roll. So this is the technology, the ultrasonic spray coating system. Um, and then, of course, um, here you have uh, a view of, of, of our system. Check if, if it works. So here you see um, on the top, you see the droplets generated. Here you have your shroud gas coming out, and then it takes it in a specific, um, you can see it here, in a specific cone. It takes the droplets towards the substrate. So this is uh, how the system works. 
um, you have a visual uh, view on, on, on the system. And of course, we would like to optimize um, the use of this ultrasonic spray coating for, for versatile um, applications. And that's, that's a bit what I would like to talk about uh, further in this, uh, in this presentation. So I talked about droplet generation. And if you talk about droplet generation, the first thing you think about is, okay, what type of ink do we use? And if you talk about inks, you can talk about the rheology, the viscosity, surface tension, and these kind of things of the ink. And that means that um, you can come up with uh, this kind of um, uh, dimensionless numbers. Huh? We, have, we have some dimensionless numbers, um, let's say here, the Onosort number, which is very known from inkjet printing, uh, where you have the viscosity and the density and the surface tension of your of your ink, um, and that gives, uh, let's say, some information on um, the viscosity and the inertial effects of your uh, capillary thinning. Um, but you also have uh, what we call the elastic elastic capillary number here, um, and that gives a relationship between, let's say. Uh, the viscous effect and the el elastic effects of your of your liquid, and finally you have your Deborah number, uh, which also gives uh, a relationship between elastic properties and inertial properties of your liquid. And these are properties related to, let's say, the the, the fluid itself. Um, so, if you um, uh, look at the material uh, property-based dimensionless numbers, uh, I mentioned them. These are uh, the ones. But of course, if you if you look at um, dripping, jetting, how to create these these droplets, then of course you also have to use or to look at dynamic uh, dimensionless numbers. Huh? And there we have uh, the capillary number, the Weber number, and the Weisenberg number, which are also located here. And here, what you see here, for example, is the velocity of the jet. If you talk about inkjet printing, you can also talk about the velocity of of um, the liquid that comes into um, the, the ultrasonic uh, nozzle plate. So these things you have to uh, look into and compare them to the material-based dimensionless numbers to know, okay, do I have uh, generation of droplets? What will be the diameter of my droplets? What will be the final speed of my droplets? So these are things um, to study, to investigate uh, on droplet generation, let's say. And if you think about what, when do we have a droplet that comes loose, huh? you have a generated amplitude on the nozzle plate, like, like I show here. And of course, if the amplitude becomes bigger and break, bigger at a certain moment, at a critical amplitude, you will, you, you will have the break off of these nozzles, uh, of these droplets. Uh, so like, like is shown in this graphical abstract here. So the amplitude that, that is uh, applied, of course, depends on the frequency that we apply. It depends on the uh, density, uh, the, the, the speed of light in the liquid itself, and also the power you apply per area. So you have a nozzle plate with a specific area. You apply a specific power to what, to on, on a specific area. So this this Y, uh, this I is um, linked to the power per surface area. And of course, uh, that should be, this amplitude that you apply should be bigger than the critical amplitude that is uh, defined here. And this critical amplitude in, in the years, let's say 1960, 1970, and so on, is uh, is worked on a lot to define, let's say, the, the, uh, the droplet size, droplet diameter uh, for ultrasonic uh, generated or atomized liquids. And uh, the first one uh, was was uh, proposed by Lang, uh, where you see here the correlation between the droplet size and the applied frequency, uh, the surface tension of your liquid, the density of your liquid. So um, this is material-based uh, relationship. But of course, uh, it was modified a bit by Rajan and Pandit some years later, um, where they show that that it's it's of course it depends on your material properties, but it also depends, like you see here, on the Weber number, on the area that you apply. So it also depends on your chatting properties. So this is very important that you have a combination of material-based properties and jetting properties to define the droplet size of your uh, dr droplets that you that you generate. So you have uh, relationships with the, between them. Uh, you, you generate your droplets 
Uh, you can calculate based on the liquids, based on, on the uh, rheological properties of your liquid, what to expect from droplets. But then, of course, if you go further, you really want to see, is, is it true? Is the droplets that we generate, droplets that, that um, we, um, we fire towards a substrate, are they really the size that, that we expect? So then I had, um, we, had, we had some research together with the, the Max Planck Institute in Mainz where we developed a, a measure, measurement system to, to measure these droplets. And we used photon correlation spectroscopy and turbidimetry uh, to measure not only the, the size or the diameter of the droplets, but also the speed of them. Um, and then we compared that with high-speed camera images to, to compare the, the technologies with each other. So here you see the setup. This is really to, to measure the droplet transport and uh, the droplets uh, flowing, flowing from the, the nozzle towards the substrate. Um, and um, yeah, you have the boat and the turbidimetry and the PCS um, measuring the droplet size and, and the droplet uh, velocity. And then here you see uh, the photon correlation spectroscopy that we used. You measure in principle the droplet speed and the droplet speed is depending on, on the frequency you apply. It's depending, of course, on the incident light wavelength that we use to, to measure. Um, you have a specific scattering angle. Um, you have the refractive index, which is there. And then you have the angle between the velocity factor, so the way the droplet is moving towards the substrate, if it is perpendicular or not. Um, and of course, uh, the scattering vector, uh, in which direction the wavelength is scattered uh, onto the, on the droplet. So that's... Um, uh, an important uh, angle to take. And we always uh, calculate it around, let's say, 80 degrees uh, because we have the, dr the droplets not moving perfectly perpendicular and we put the, the light beam not perfectly uh, perpendicular onto the, onto the cone. So this way you calculate the speed. And then with, if you use the speed, so if you use this uh, photon correlation spectroscopy in combination with the turbidimetry, you can also start calculating or measuring the droplet diameter. And this droplet diameter um, is then uh, a relationship where you have the, the, the absorption of your wavelength of your light in, inside your uh, cone. Uh, so this the intensity of, of the weakened uh, light beam over the uh, incident light intensity. Um, you have some coefficients, you have the pot length through the medium, which is important. And then based on that, uh, you can calculate um, the, the final, the, the, the diameter. So based on this, based on these calculations and these measurements, we, are, we were able to, to measure the diameter of the droplets and also the speed of the droplets when moving towards the substrate. And um, we compare that with, um, with, with high-speed camera images. This is a high-speed camera image of the droplets. Um, this is turned 90 degrees. So you, you have the nozzle here and you have your substrate here. So you will see droplets moving from right to left on your screen. If I start the video, um, that should work, that you see here. And then what we did, of course, is, is taking this original picture uh, every frames, let's say, and then moving uh, or, or doing some, some processing to finally find the diameter and, and the amount of, of droplets that we see in such, a, in such a cone. And then we compared these results and we came to the conclusion that we are uh, experimentally very close to, to the results that we expect from, from theory, from, uh, from Lang and from um, um, the other um, systems that, that were uh, derived or theor theoretical formulas that were derived. And then I said, yeah, it's it's important to take also the ultrasonic spray coating parameters into account eh, because you generate your droplets at the nozzle plate, but then of course you have to bring the, the droplets towards the substrate and you have a lot of parameters that, that influence it. Eh? I, I mentioned already the distance between the, the, the nozzle and the substrate, uh, the temperature of the substrate, but also, and, and much more important for droplet um, transport, are, for example, um, the shroud pressure. So the pressure applied to the shroud, which is which is normal because the higher the pressure, the the more energy you give to the droplets or to the surrounding gas, 
that take these these droplets towards the substrates and you see nice relationships so we measured the, the speed of the droplets in comparison to the short pressure and of course you see the higher the short pressure the higher the, your droplet speeds going to uh, a few thousands of millimeters per second uh, for these droplets um, uh, and and um, this is a perfect um, relationship that, that, that could be measured for uh, the short pressure. Um, if we, for example, add this, this is a com uh, correlation, uh, this is the um, photoelectron, uh, the, sorry, the, the PCS, uh, photocorrelation spectroscopy, and these are the high-speed camera images, and you see more or less the same. So we, we compare those both techniques, and we see that both techniques are giving the same results. Um, we did the same for the flow rate. So the amount of material that you deposit per, per second or per minute, in this case, it's, it's milliliters per minute. And you see a small change in the speed at the droplet speed on the flow rate. Uh, the, the, the more uh, material you deposit per, uh, per time, uh, the lower the droplet speed uh, becomes. And you see the same trend in uh, photocorrelation spectroscopy, but also with the high speed camera. And a final one was the uh, the influence of the, the shroud pressure and the flow rate on the droplet diameter. And so we had the droplet speed on the one side where we saw nice correlations, but you see that the shroud pressure is not influencing the droplet diameter, which is also something we expect uh, or we hope anyway, because of course, the, the carrier gas uh, should not influence your droplet diameter. However, if you look at the flow rate, uh, you see that the higher the flow rate becomes, the bigger the diameter becomes. And, and that probably has to do with the fact that you have more material there and more material means that the droplets are closer to each other and you have the chance that some droplets will, will, uh, will, will merge and, and form bigger droplets. So this is, let's say, an, an, a relationship between the droplet diameter and the flow rate. <coughs> so, um, yeah, we, we have generated these droplets and then, and then we move them, we transport them towards the substrate. And the final thing you want to look into is, of course, the impact on the substrate itself. Huh? You have uh, an optimized layer formation. If you want a specific functional coating being 100 nanometers in thickness, you want this coating to be very conformal, very homogeneous in thickness over the complete area that you deposit. So that's why we look at, at droplet impact and layer formation. And one of my PhD students made, made this, uh, this very, um, let's say, interesting um, graphic to, to show, movie to show what, what is um, the thing we try to do with ultrasonic spray coating. Um, so if you, if you take all these droplets and you put all these droplets onto the substrate and you would like to have a final layer thickness of around 80 micrometers, well, that's quite easy if you have a droplet um, with a size of 20 microns and because with, with a bit of um, uh, chemistry, flow chemistry, you can optimize a very smooth, uh, thick, uh, 80 micrometer thick layer. <coughs> However, what we focus on are layers having a thickness in, in the order of a few hundreds or even uh, for a specific polymer, P.PSS, going to 30 nanometers. So very, very thin. And of course, if you then look at a droplet having a size of 20 microns, that's really, that's really nasty. So what you what you would like to have is that the functional material, the material that finally ends onto the substrate and is not evaporated, should be a very small amount of the final droplet. So you have, if you compare that to nanoparticles having a size of 60 nanometers and you put 0.1 weight percent of these nanoparticles, you have 27,000 nanoparticles per droplet, uh, which is, in if you calculate that, uh, on specific properties of, of the ultrasonic spray coater, of course, you have, for example, a coverage of 25%. So if you then move over it four times, in principle, you think you have a, a coverage of 100%. Having a nanoparticle of 60 nanometers gives you uh, this layer thickness around 300 nanometers. So if you want to go to 30 nanometers with nanoparticles, you really have to go to very small nanoparticles. And with polymers, of course, a very low amount, a very low concentration of your functional material. This is a final result, a, a topographic image 
where you see the roughness still uh, because these are nanoparticles you still see quite some roughness on the the final layer so then you need also post processing to smoothen these layers out um, <clears throat> this is this is um, a view of, of this post processing uh, so you do a, a, a deposition and of course if you do one deposition um, what happens is that you have nanoparticles or the, what you want is this 25 percent coverage and then of course if you put 10 layers up to 30 layers and you do some annealing you would like to achieve this you would like to achieve the stacking of all those nanoparticles nicely together to form a very smooth uh, final layer however what you get uh, because now you're not only talking about the uh, droplets and, and the formulation of the droplet itself, the ink formulation, but you also talk about the substrate and, and the behavior at the surface free energy of your substrate. You also talk about um, flow behavior there. So you talk about Marangoni flows and coffee ring effects. So what you get if you deposit is that these nanoparticles tend to move towards uh, the edge of the, of the ring or move uh, towards together and, and form these these clusters and then of course if you put 30 layers you get this and so it's also about optimizing <clears throat> the impact of the of the droplets onto the substrate and then there's a lot of of research done already on on this um, and for ultrasonic spray coating also there is there is some research there and then we talk about um, the amount of um, uh, wet droplets that arrive at the substrate and you have the wet regime um, the dry regime and the optimum and that means in principle and uh, the distance between the nozzle and the substrate in ult ultrasonic spray coating is a few centimeters five to seven centimeters and that means means that if you have a droplet of 20 micrometer that during the flight and depending on the speed depending on the on the surrounding temperature and so on that partly your uh, solvent will evaporate and if it evaporates completely then you arrive in the dry regime and then you get uh, this uh, because you have a lot of um, nanoparticles deposited all over the place but of course if 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 your droplets is still wet uh, what you have is that um, due to the fact that you have the coffee ring effect most of your um, uh, nanoparticles will move towards the edges because of the specific uh, evaporation of, of your uh, solvents. Uh, so you also have to play with optimized solvents, core solvent systems to finally arrive at, at what they call the optimum, uh, where the distance uh, between the, the nozzle and the uh, substrate is optimized. Um, the distance here, uh, you see going to 60, 65 millimeters, uh, six and a half centimeters, gives an, a more optimal uh, final result. So this is the influence of, of the height of the nozzle. Um, you also have the influence of the, um, the, the temperature of, of the solvents that you use. So you can use a high boiling solvent, cyclohexane, for example, or going to tichlorometane and so on. So this also plays a role on, 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 on the, the evaporation and the final layer formation. So you always have to think about not only temperature and distance and so on, um, um, but also um, using optimal uh, ink formulations to achieve nice results, nice layers. <clears throat> and of course, uh, optimizing the, the wetting properties, um, the surface tension of your substrate itself also plays a tremendous role in uh, in the final layer formation so knowing this knowing that we have to we, we generate droplets around 20 uh, 20 micrometers knowing that the all the parameters that we have in ultrasonic spray coating uh, the the distance the temperature the the uh, flow rate uh, the shroud pressure and so on plays a tremendous role in um, not only the speed of the droplets, but also a bit on the diameter of the droplets. And of course, looking at different substrates and looking at different properties of these substrates as well, uh, we know that there's a lot of, of work to be done to optimize layers depending on, on the ink you want to deposit and uh, the, the specific material you want to deposit and the substrate you want to deposit it on. So that was the work of uh, several collaborations and several uh, PhD students and, 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 and the postdoc and, and some 
uh, project engineers in, in my research group. And today I would like to, to show a few of those uh, results uh, and, and to be, let's say, a bit all over the place. Um, we focus on solution based inks and suspensions so nanoparticle based or even micro micro particle based uh, inks but also polymer based inks and a combination of those <laughs> let's start with the first one uh, let's start with organic light emitting devices um, so it's this is really depositing to the uh, very very thin layers uh, from polymer-based uh, solutions. In the end, the, the aim of, of the research we do on organic light emitting devices is, of course, making performant organic light emitting devices, but completely spray coated. Huh? If you look at technology that is used nowadays for organic light e emitting devices, then on the one hand, you have vacuum deposition, where um, you use expensive uh, equipment, uh, vacuum, high vacuum, to, to deposit this organic light emitting devices. And this mainly is used, uh, this clean room techn technology mainly is used for organic light emitting devices in, in this place. If you look at lighting, then we move more and more towards different uh, printing techniques. We talk about spin coating. Uh, and what we would like to investigate is can we deposit very thin coatings on top of each other um, with ultrasonic spray coating only to achieve a performant organic light emitting device. And you see the materials that we use, you have the substrate. Uh, we do some research towards PSS and silver nanowires for the, the electrodes and the, the hole injection layer. Um, we put a light emitting layer. Uh, we use super yellow, which is a commercial uh, PPV material, and then we use at uh, replacing calcium um, with with pay or pay as an uh, electron injection electron transport layer to finally put an electrode which can be aluminum, which is standardly aluminum, uh, calcium aluminum, or maybe silver because silver can also be spray coated. So that's <clears throat> the research we do um, since since uh, let's say 2014. Uh, onwards um, and and the results I show today is, is only the results on super yellow so all these things and uh, one of, of um, my, my PhD students uh, coming uh, from uh, India uh, Rachid, um, is, is also working on, on this using nanoparticles incorporated in, in these polymers to optimize the outcoupling but that, of course, is something which is still under research. So today, I only sh show the, the results on the light emitting layer. And of course, one of the things you want to know if you, if you do ultrasonic spray coating of these polymers is what happens with the polymers during ultrasonic uh, vibrations. Uh, and that's, that's what we investigated. So we took the specific polymer, this um, <clears throat> PPV, super yellow polymer, and we looked at um, do we have some some backbones on the? Uh, of, do we do we have cleavage of the backbone, or do we have uh, cleavage or scission of 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 this uh, side uh, chains? Um, so what we did, we ultrasonically uh, spray coated or um, polymer or super yellow, and then looked, for example, in absorption to see if we have um, scission in the polymer backbone. Um, we did some NMR and some FDIR measurements to see uh, the pristine solution, which is spin coated and the ultrasonically vibrated system. Uh, do we have some <coughs> side change that are cleaved off? Um, but we couldn't find any any uh, change in the polymer uh, composition. So that, that made us conclude that this ultrasonic vibrations do not have uh, much impact on, on the polymer composition, probably because you have it in, in a specific ink formulation and not only the polymer itself. So then we started to investigate the influence of the spray coating parameters on the layer thickness. And for example, here you see the flow rate um, in, um, and, 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 and uh, you see the, the layer thickness in function of this flow rate. And uh, to, to be uh, concrete uh, or specific, <coughs> sorry, to be specific, uh, we need a thickness for this super yellow, for this light emitting layer, around 80 nanometers. So for us, that means 
Uh, having uh, 1.6 milliliters per minute is an optimum. If we have a constant speed, so the movement of the nozzle over the substrate of 15.15 millimeters per second. So that's also something that we investigated here, uh, taking a constant flow of 1.5 milliliters per minute. What is the optimal speed? And then you see uh, you go to 14 to 15 millimeters per second for a layer thickness of 80 nanometers. And then finally, right, the layer thickness in function of the concentration. So what concentrations do we need? And you see we go up. So we need to go to a concentration of 3 to 4 milligrams per milliliter to achieve around this 80 nanometers. But we saw that going higher than this 4 milligrams per milliliter uh, give us some, some problems in, in uh, ultrasonic vibration. So in uh, efficiently <coughs> transferring the, the power into a specific uh, um, wavelength or amplitude uh, to generate a droplet. So that's that's something that we that we took into account. Finally, we optimized the parameters for spray coating and we look at, at atomic force microscopy. Um, here you see an ultrasonic spray coated sample having a thickness of 80 mi uh, nanometers, finally having a roughness around 2.8 nanometers, while if you compare it with a spin coated one on the left side, you see a roughness around 1.2 nanometers. So roughness wise, it's it seems to be okay. It's it's not perfectly the same as spin coating, but it's quite okay uh, if you if you think about 80 nanometers, 2.8 nanometers is is quite okay. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, yeah, uh, we we looked of course at the current density and and the luminous power efficacy of these devices, and and, and we see nice results, comparable results to spin coating on the current density. Um, the luminous flux gave also more or less the same results as we have with spin coating, and we have a somewhat lower luminous power efficacy uh, than, than with spin coating, where for spin coating we could go to, let's say, 15 to 20 lumen per watt for this specific stack and this specific material. But <coughs> we concluded that this, this is the, the final design or the final, sorry, the final layer that we, that we printed. Um, you saw the video already earlier, and I have the impression that it doesn't start if I want to show the movie, but um, you saw it earlier. Right? You have a light emitting device uh, with a spray coated light emitting layer. So we compared spin coating with ultrasonic spray coating. Film, film roughnesses are uh, 2.8 or 3 nanometers, which is okay. It is roll to roll compatible. That's spin coating is not. Um, do we have solution waste? Well, yeah, we, we still have a bit of overspray. So we have, let's say, 5 to 10% of, of um, uh, material waste. But of course, if you compare that to spin coating, which is really high in, in material waste, this is a perfect technology. Solution preparation is simple. Uh, it's a solvent with, with your polymer. Um, we can go to 3D uh, patterns that I will show later. Um, and we are not depending on, on the surface area. We can go really, really large area. So this is a very uh, nice um, technology, for example, to deposit these uh, layers of the ultrasonic uh, of the organic light emitting device with, with ultrasonic spray coating. The next thing I would like to, to focus on now is, is going to nanoparticles. And uh, you see uh, we, can, we can deposit nanoparticles going from 5 to 10 nanometers up to more than 1 micrometer. We tried nanoparticles, not nanoparticles anymore, particles having a size of a few micrometers, but then concentration starts to play a big role. Because of course, if you, if you uh, generate droplets having a size, a diameter of 20 microns, having, drop, having uh, particles in there of a few micrometers, uh, that becomes already critical. So we can go to one, two micrometer in, uh, in size of, of the particles, and then a low concentration, um, but that's, let's say, the limit of the system. Um, so I will start uh, with the, the middle one. Uh, I do not show the, the results on, on the on the biosensor uh, in view of time. I will start with polystyrene moving towards these organic uh, solar cells, and then show this hybrid magnetic plasmonic uh, nanocomposites. So those are the two uh, from big to small. Um, <coughs> if we want uh, to to make organic uh, solar cells, one of the ways to do that. Um, is 
uh, to, to combine a donor and an acceptor, uh, what you need in, in uh, the active material for or the active layer for your organic solar cell, to combine that in one nanoparticle. Uh, we have a nanoparticle of 60 nanometers, which is made by, by colleagues in our research institute, and uh, it has a donor and an acceptor material included in this uh, nanoparticle, and that has the, 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 the ambition to be more efficient because you, ha you need to have donor and acceptor material all over the place, all over the, the, the active material, but very close to each other as well, because you need transitions from the donor, uh, from the acceptor, from the donor to the acceptor, in ranges that that vary between 10 and and, and 100 nanometers. So this is, let's say, if we have it in, in 60 nanometers, then the transport um, from the one to the other one is is more uh, easy. Of course, because making these nanoparticles with the donor and acceptor material in there. Uh, is is expensive because the the donor and acceptor materials are quite expensive, so that's why um, um, when we when we made this photovoltaic devices, um, we didn't go directly for um, these materials. Uh, it's P3 P3 HD PCBM and and so on, quite expensive. We moved to uh, polystyrene, having more or less the same dimensions. It was not 16 nanometers, but 18 nanometers. Um, but then uh, studied the layer formation there. Um, and as I show here, um, um, flow rate and nozzle speed give you the amount of ink per area per time. The amount of nanoparticles in there and the amount of layers gives you the amount of deposited material. And then if you play with the cost solvent ratio and the temperature, you can optimize the layer formation. So finally, uh, we played with the deposition temperature, we played with the nozzle speed, uh, we played with the co-solvent ratio and with the flow rate, and we could optimize the parameters such that in the end we could have a very nice, very homogeneous distribution of our polystyrene nanoparticles. This is the final result. Here you see the, the parameters. Uh, we only sprayed one layer, so it's not uh, moving over and over. So this thickness, final thickness, is around uh, 100 nanometers which of course is, is what we need if we would like to go to um, a working device of an uh, organic solar cell. But of course you have to view, you still have some pinholes there and this is something that you have to remove. So if we move to the donor acceptor material, the pre P3HD PCBM, then it's important to also play uh, again with the parameters to finally achieve an, an, a closed layer and to get this closed layer, we needed an in situ treatment of around, let's say, 200 degrees centigrade to more or less melt these nanoparticles and, and have a, a flow, a homogeneous covering of the layer. And this is, uh, this is of course, influencing the final properties, because if we finally look at um, our final layer and, and, and an organic photovoltaic device, the efficiency we reached with ultrasonic spray coating was only 0.1%. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that we heat up our substrate or, or sample or printed layers or coated layers to 200 degrees centigrade, which is detrimental uh, for, these nano, for these nanoparticles and for these donor acceptor materials that, in principle, only can um, achieve uh, 50 to 60 degrees centigrade temperature treatment. So this is really influencing the efficiency. So this is something we still have to work on to optimize, let's say, the, the, the smoothness of the layer and the coverage of the layer to achieve highly efficient uh, devices. <laughs> and the second one, if we go to nanoparticles, uh, 5 to 10 nanometers, we worked with uh, people in, in KU Leuven, uh, also in Belgium, that work on magnetoplasmonic nanocomposites. So they use silver and gold uh, in, in uh, alternating stacks. Um, to make um, systems that, for example, um, can have specific um, light going through and, and other uh, direction of light uh, blocked. Um, and they always do that with um, what, what they call dip coating or layer, layer by layer synthesis. And this, of course, is a technique which is not upscalable and which takes a lot of time. So we investigated ultrasonic spray coating for this. Um, so we deposited, or we started to deposit this gold uh, nanoparticles, five nanometers on our substrates. And the 
sorry, the interesting thing you can see is that if you do three layers, you have a coverage which is very low. And then, of course, the more layers you put, the more coverage, the, the, the more the substrate is covered. On the other hand, what you also see is that you have some clusters. So you have nanoparticles sticking together. And that, of course, is not what you, what you would like to see. You would like to see individual nanoparticles sticking onto the substrate. So if you look at area fraction, of course, the amount of layers, gold layers you see, then the area fraction is, is uh, going up to uh, 35%. And of course, the more layers you put, the higher this area fraction will become. And that means that ultrasonic spray coating can be used as a system to deposit uh, specific coverage of, of your area with nanoparticles. But like I said, what we see is also a redshift. And that means that these nanoparticles will cluster together. The gold nanoparticles will cluster together. And you see this uh, change in uh, what you expect your absorption peak <clears throat> of your gold nanoparticle, 5 to 10 nanometers, around 530 nanometers, you see that you get a red shift. Uh, and, and that means that we have clustering of our nanoparticles. So that's something that we um, have to optimize by playing with, let's say, the, <clears throat> the composition or, or the, the way the nanoparticles are um, synthesized. Um, so this is an, another representation of, of the, the redshift we see. And then on top of this gold, we put the uh, magnetic uh, nanoparticles, which is in this case um, the silver. And of course, <clears throat> what, we, what we did in synthesizing or what the people in Leuven did in synthesizing is um, putting li ligands to the, to the nanoparticles such that the silver can only bind to the gold and not to the substrate. And that means if, if that's the case, that you only can have the same coverage as you uh, have uh, had in the beginning with gold. So for example, if we have five times gold and we put several layers of, of silver on top, then of course your uh, nanoparticles will, <coughs> sorry, will, uh, will only stick to the, to the gold and you will have always the same coverage. And that's what you see here. Eh? If we have an, an area fraction of, of gold having 25 or 26, uh, we do not change from one to even seven layers. We do not change that much in surface coverage. So this is more or less uh, showing that the silver is only binding to the, to the gold. And then we, we optimize the stack having one, three, uh, and so on, uh, gold, silver stacks on top of each other to optimize the Faraday rotation. And the Faraday rotation is, is in principle showing how easy a specific oriented light can, uh, can tr um, penetrate through or be absorbed by the, uh, the coated layers. So this to show that also very, very small nanoparticles can be coated with ultrasonic spray coating. And as a last example in this presentation, I would like to go to um, 3D applications. So we, we looked at uh, additive manufactured pieces and, and the, the uh, roughness reduction of these additive manufactured pieces. Uh, if you think about 3D printing or additive manufacturing, then you have several techniques. I, I listed a few here, uh, SLA, FDM, uh, SLS. Um, but the, the, the biggest disadvantage of these technologies is that um, in the end, uh, the roughness of the, of the object you print is quite high. It's, it's around 10 to 20 micrometers. And they use techniques to, let's say, smoothen the surface by um, <clears throat> so selective uh, grinding, for example, of the object. So you have the subtractive techniques as post-treatment. Um, you also have additive techniques. And we used ultrasonic uh, spray coating as an additive technique to put a, a layer on top to smoothen the roughness. And if, you, if we looked at PA12, um, selective laser centered, this is the, the, the morphology and, and the, the topography of the of the substrate so this is a substrate and what you see is that you have quite a rough substrate but also that uh, it's still quite porous and these are things that we that we tried to um to investigate in 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 this work so um what we did we started with pvdf in aceton 
And later we also added nanoparticles. So it's not a purely polymer based material, but it's a hybrid material, hybrid inked, where we use polymers and nanoparticles to optimize um, the roughness, but also to add functionality. And the functionality we added uh, using these nanoparticles is super hydrophobicity. So that's something that, that we investigated. And if you look at the results, if we only use PVDF, uh, we use 4.5 weight percent uh, uh, in, in PVDF in acetone, we could, could achieve after 30 layers, we could achieve a roughness of 4.54 microns, where you, sh you saw in, in, uh, in, in earlier slides here that the roughness was around 20 microns. So going down to 4.4 microns is, is, uh, is nice. Uh, and here you see SEM images where you see that um, the, the PVDF is penetrating a bit in the top area of your, um, of your 3D printed part and getting in the end very smooth uh, layers that covers uh, completely the 3D object. Um, then yeah, achieving 4.4 microns is, is a 74% reduction. But when we talk to industrial partners in, in 3D printing, they said that's not enough. If you want industrial grade, you need to go below two microns. So that's why we started to adding silicon nanoparticles. Yeah, so here you have the number of layers. Um, and here you have the, the roughness where we have 4.2 weight percent of PVDF. 0.8 weight percent of silica nanoparticles in our acetone. And then what you see is that uh, after, let's say, 28 layers, we achieved the roughness below 2 microns, which is the industrial standard, as I uh, explained before. So achieving, um, uh, optimizing the ink, uh, the, the amount of nanoparticles in, in PVDF or compared to PDF, uh, PVDF in acetone, um, and optimizing that for the amount of layers gives uh, a very smooth layer. Um, but the, the advantage of having nanoparticles in there is also that you can have a specific frequent or, or repetitive um, nanoparticle uh, deposition. And that means that you can also use it for hydrophobic or super hydrophobic applications. And that's what we investigated. So the amount of nanoparticles in PVDF we measured the advancing and receding water contact angle. And what you see is that <clears throat> it goes up to 130, 140 here if you put a lot of nanoparticles in there. And then, of course, if we take 3.5 and this one, 3.5 weight percent of PVDF and 1.5 weight percent of silica nanoparticles, we achieved 140, 150 in uh, advancing and receding contact angle. And even with 25, 20 to 25 layers, we have super hydrophobic behavior and that's what you see here so here we have uh, the results of one which is um, not coated and one which is coated and like you see here the non-coated one the droplet will stick to the substrate while here super super hydrophobic uh, you see that the droplet uh, sticks or stays as, as a droplet and really flows over the surface so you make easy to clean uh, applications by just coating a 3d object uh, 3D printed object with a combination of PVDF, silica nanoparticles in, in acetone. And then one could say, uh, why do you use ultrasonic spray coating? Because with ultrasonic spray coating, you see you need to go to 25 to 30 layers. Why can't you just use um, the, um, the pressurized spray coating? Because there directly you put more material and maybe that that uh, optimizes uh, your result in a faster more industrial relevant way well that's that's true but that's something that we investigated uh, here you see the pneumatic spray coating industrial spray coating here you see ultrasonic spray coating and what is obvious is that the uh, pvdf the polymer uh, intringes more into the substrate in the porous uh, surface of the 3d printed part than the pressurized one and that's normal uh, for the simple reason that um, here the droplets that you fire towards the substrate have a very low kinetic energy while with pressurized spray coating the speed of the of the droplets uh, is much higher and that means that they will not penetrate inside the the, the first let's say few micrometers of, of your 3d printed part but will stick on top um, so that's an, an advantage because um, 
you do not alter, let's say, the dimension of your 3D printed part, but also improve the adhesion uh, because if the PVDF absorbs a bit inside the uh, the SLS printed uh, PA12 part, then also the uh, the adhesion of the the coating on top or, or inside the the 3D printed part is is better sticking. So that's also a beneficial thing. Um, here you can see an, an, an optimized uh, graph uh, scanning electron microscopy of, of the, uh, the ultrasonic spray coated layer. Uh, so that concludes my, my talk. Uh, we showed that uh, for polymer based, we, we can put very thin coatings. Uh, I showed 80 nanometers, but we can go to 30 nanometers on 2D objects for organic light emitting devices. I showed that we uh, can deposit nanoparticles uh, for organic solar cells down to 5 to 10 nanometer nanoparticles for this uh, magnetoplasmonic nanocomposites. And then finally, I also showed that on 3D objects, because the distance between the nozzle and the substrate is around 5 to 6 centimeters, you can also coat easily 3D objects, 3D printed objects, to reduce the roughness, uh, to add functionality, not only uh, super hydrophobicity, but anything you put in, in the ink can influence uh, a specific property like scratch resistant uh, or anti-reflective or wh whatever you would like to add to your functional coating on top of a 3D part. Um, and uh, this uh, concludes uh, my talk uh, on, on ultrasonic spray coating and the versatile applications that you can achieve with this and with this i would like to thank first of all uh, you again for for listening and for inviting me for this talk but also all the people that that worked on this uh, this technique and these applications uh, my research group um, some alumni and some master students that worked uh, during the last years on, on this so thanks and i see that in the chat there were some questions so um, for sure uh, I would like to uh, answer uh, a few of those if possible. Yes. So, Bim, you can just take those questions which are there in the chat box. Could you hear me? We could hear you, Veda. Yeah, Vip, are you able to hear us? Thanks I for the talk. I can hear you. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Veda is suggesting that uh, we can take the questions that are already in the chat box. Yeah. Are you able to see the questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I see I see indeed the first question from uh, Dr. Ramesh. Um, what the efficiency of the organic solar cells is? Well, like I explained, uh, the, 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 uh, the efficiency of the organic solar cells that we ultrasonically spray coated is, is below 1%. Um, but if you compare that to spin coated ones with these nanoparticles specifically, they go to 3 4%. Uh, they still talk about new innovative materials, um, organic. Um, so let's say that, that the efficiency there is very, very low uh, still. Um, if if you do not interrupt me, I can go to the to the next question. Yeah, you you can uh, just start taking one by one. Yeah. Um, then, does the ultrasonic spray coating technique help in coating thin films, two to five microns of tungsten, uh, high density particles on high temperature materials like Inconel? Um, well. If if we um, if if the tungsten uh, particles are small enough um, and we can deposit it in in low concentration, um, I'm quite sure that that we can deposit uh, thin films uh, a few micrometer thick uh, of these of these th these tungsten nanoparticles. So in principle, that should be a technology to be used. Um, but of course, that's something to compare to the standard techniques that are used at the moment. Uh, and then what is the mechanism of bonding between the substrate and the nanoparticle well um, in principle uh, the thing we did is is just depositing these nanoparticles on top of the substrate so we do not really have uh, a chemical bond um, it depends on on the application if you look at 
the uh, hybrid plasmonic, magnetic plasmonic nanoparticles, so the gold, there we really had linkers on the gold and on the substrate to, to make a chemical bond uh, between those nanoparticles and the substrate. Um, but for example, the, the, um, the, the polystyrene or the nanoparticles for the organic solar cells, we didn't uh, do that. So it was just physical absorption on the, on the substrate. And for the last example, the 3D printed part, yeah, there we had a bit of, of absorption of these nanoparticles together with the solvent inside the, the, the open porous structure on top of, of the 3D printed part, um, which improves the adhesion, but which is not really a chemical uh, um, uh, bonding. Um, Vida, you ask, how do you reduce the agglomeration of nanoparticles? Um, if you if you mean agglomeration of nanoparticles when they are on the substrate, um, well, that's that's a good question, and eh? um, I think that's that's a difficult task um, just by achieving having specific nanoparticles without any linker or any um, chemical structure on on top of the nanoparticle to to prevent agglomeration. Um, the only way to do that is to play with the um, the ultrasonic spray coating parameters and to be able to deposit these nanoparticles in more or less a dry state onto the substrate uh, because if you have an, an, a droplet where you still have the solvent and some nanoparticles that uh, arrive at the substrate and then you still have the evaporation of the solvent happening then for sure your nanoparticles will move they, they are still mobile because of the solvent and they move towards each other and they will cluster together or they will agglomerate. So it, it is a, a tedious task to only do it with ultrasonic spray coating and with tuning the parameters. Um, there you have a very small window where you can where you can play with specific parameters of spray coating and it takes a lot of optimization um, to achieve that. So better there is to go to chemical roads and, and, and do some um, linkers and, and, and chemical uh, preparation, pre-treatment of the substrate and the nanoparticles to, to prevent agglomeration, I think. Well, this adhesion strength of ultrasonic spray coated nanoparticles, I think, I think it's the same. Right? It again depends on how you prepare your nanoparticle, how you prepare your substrate. Um, we didn't really measure that. Um, so, and then tool or software to measure the droplet size. Well, we we um, we are developing this this um, let's say software. We have the tool now. Um, I explained that in in earlier slides, where I showed that we have this uh, photocorrelation spectroscopy and this turbidimetry um, to to measure the uh, the droplet size and the droplet speed. Um, you can also use a high-speed camera, but that then it becomes really expensive because you really need high frame rates and, and, and um, very good resolution to be able to completely map all the droplets. Um, uh, but of course, then we need to, to model and to, to make a software to, to, uh, to be able to um, to define the, 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 the size and, and the speed of the droplets. And what would be very interesting indeed is, is that we can move the measurement system also from the nozzle towards completely the substrate and everything in between, such that we can see what is the, the change in droplet speed and the change in droplet diameter during the flight from the nozzle to the substrate. That, that's, that's very, very interesting to be, to be investigated. Um, if you talk about cost comparison um, of the ultrasonic spray coated versus the pneumatic one, well, I think the only difference there is um, the, the systems are more or less comparable. A pneumatic spray coating and ultrasonic spray coating are in system costs are the same. Um, <clears throat> speed wise, I think pneumatic is faster because you only have to apply one or a few layers where with the ultrasonic spray coat, we have to go over it 30 times to have a, a, a smooth layer. Um, so in, in production time, it will be a li little bit more expensive. But on the other hand, you also have the advantage 
that it's smoother um, and, and um, that you can apply also different functionalities uh, and, and thinner